Good morning, everyone. Welcome to NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I'm Gay Yi Hill. Two weeks ago, the Dawn spacecraft entered orbit around the asteroid Vesta, and today we are releasing new pictures. And you'll get the opportunity to hear from the scientists and engineers. But first, let's take a moment and introduce you to JPL's director, Dr. Charles Alachi, for some opening remarks. Dr. Alachi. Thank you, and uh, good morning, all, and uh, welcome to NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. And we hope we're going to be seeing you pretty often this year, because we have a lot of activity going on. And as Dr. Hartman will be mentioning, this is just the first salvo of many missions and a lot of encounter and exciting scientific results that will happen in the next 12 months, culminating in the landing of Curiosity on Mars exactly a year and nine days and one hour and 15 minutes and three seconds from the time we are talking here. Hopefully it will be all successful. Uh, and it will be roughly the same time that uh, Don will be leaving Vesta and heading towards Ceres, exploring another world uh, you know, for, for science and, uh, and, and learning about our solar system. Now, when we talk about asteroid, people immediately think of small, rocky objects. Just to put it in perspective, Vesta is much larger than the state of California and it has some very exciting geomorphological features and composition features that you'll be hearing about today, which shed some light about how our solar system actually was formed. And this was enabled by a very advanced technology, which is called electric propulsion, uh, that Mark Raymond will be talking about. In my mind, when I describe it to my neighbor, I just tell them, think Star Trek. Now, we're not moving faster than the speed of light. I think we, we do respect the laws of physics, but it's kind of, in general, you know, the same idea. And I want also to thank, you know, all our colleagues who made this mission possible. Uh, this is a team effort. Uh, it involved our international partner, particularly from Italy and Germany, who played a key role in this mission. It involved our industrial partner, particularly Orbital Corporation, which developed the spacecraft. And last but not least, the superb team from UCLA and JPL and the science team, which made this mission possible. Now, usually from the outside, people think, oh, these things are easy. You know, we see animation, we see all the things, that things are easy. I have to tell you, because I know it on a day-to-day -day basis, this team faced a lot of challenges and really was able to overcome those challenges with professionalism, with calmness, with cool-headedness, and of course, with excellence that is characteristics of NASA and JPL. Thank you very much, and I guess we'll move now to hear about the exciting results. Thanks, Dr. Alachi. All right, so let's introduce you to the panelists. First, Colleen Hartman. She is the Assistant Associate Administrator, Science Mission Directorate, NASA Headquarters, Washington. Next, we go to Chris Russell. Don Principal Investigator, University of California, Los Angeles. Mark Raymond, Don Chief Engineer and Mission Director from here at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Holger Zierks, he's a part of the Framing Camera team. He's with the Max Planck Society, Katlenburg, Lindau, Germany. And finally, Enrico Flamini, Chief Scientist, Italian Space Agency, Rome, Italy. All right, let's start things off with Colleen. Thank you. My colleagues on the panel today will reveal to you striking full-frame pictures of Vesta taken by the first spacecraft to ever orbit a main belt asteroid, the Dawn spacecraft. My job here today is to tell you a little bit about how Dawn fits into the science program at NASA, as well as tell you just very quickly all of the wonderful things we're doing in 2011 in space and Earth science. So Dawn is part of the Discovery Program, and this is a highly competitive program that allows scientists to open up their imaginations and use their innovation to understand and unlock the secrets of the solar system. Discovery program missions have landed on asteroids, have discovered Earth-size extrasolar planet candidates in the habitable zone, and have flown up to the sun to breathe in solar particles and return them here to Earth for further study. So now Don is joining this pantheon of, of missions, and I want to join Charles Alachi and congratulate the 
leader and principal investigator of Dawn, Chris Russell from UCLA, the Orbital Sciences Corporation that made the spacecraft bus, the Jet Propulsion Lab that provided project management oversight for this complicated mission, and especially to our European partners who are here with us today, from Germany and from Italy, each of which provided an important component, a science instrument for this mission. Now you'll hear, as, as Charles mentioned a little later from Mark, about the ion propulsion, but I do want to mention that this innovative propulsive technology, these gentle puffs of xenon that allow us to go to not one, but two of the largest asteroids in the main belt, was developed for NASA and right here at the Jet Propulsion Lab. So now let me tell you a little bit about what we've done in the first half of 2011. Um, the Stardust Next mission has gotten up close and personal with Comet Temple 1. The MESSENGER mission has gone perfectly into orbit around Mercury. This is the first spacecraft to ever orbit Mercury. We are now mapping all of the surface of Mercury and unlocking its secrets. Then we had a JPL mission, the Aquarius mission, which uh, launched, and it will look at sea surface salinity of Mother Earth and, and help us to understand the relationship between the oceans and something important to all life, particularly we human life here on Earth, the water cycle. So in the vein of what have you done for me lately, there's the second half of 2011. And later this week, we will be launching the Juno mission, and it is filled with firsts as well as international partners. And the Juno mission will use solar power for the first time to go the five AUs to Jupiter. And there, it will be the first mission to drop into polar orbit around the planet, basically kissing the cloud tops of Jupiter. And the spacecraft will be no further away from those clouds than we are right now from New York. So then it will unlock the secrets of that um, very complicated planetary system. On to another JPL mission, the twin GRAIL spacecraft will go to the moon, return to the moon to, to map the moon's gravity field to unprecedented detail, followed by something called the NPOSE Preparatory Project. And this is a bridge mission uh, that helps us move into the future for climate and for weather here on Earth. And as Charles mentioned, last but not least is the November launch, and he had it apparently down to the second, of the Mars Science Laboratory called Curiosity. And I call it a behemoth. I mean, this is the size of a car. It has five times more science capability than any other rover we've ever put down on the surface of the red planet. And it is meant to help us determine whether Mars has been, is, or perhaps ever will be hospitable to microbial life. So with this plethora of missions, I believe there's only one guarantee, and that's that the universe consistently refuses to read our science textbooks. So we will be having new discoveries, perhaps rewriting the textbooks that children all around the world will be reading for years to come. So on this beautiful morning at the Jet Propulsion Lab with a blue sky, a new day is dawning, and we'll now go to hear more about Dawn and its investigation of Vesta. And I want to introduce my colleague and friend, Chris Russell, to tell you more. Thank you, Colleen. I'm Dawn's principal investigator, and I can uh, speak for the entire team about exactly how excited we are about this mission. Uh, we've been working on this for, uh, it seems like decades. Uh, we sent in the proposal in uh, 2000. Uh, we got the project together. It was accepted by NASA in uh, 2002. We were launched in 2007 and another four years and we're finally in orbit around Vesta and uh, it's everything, everything we ex ever expected and uh, a lot more as we will see. Uh, I want to share some of those images that we've been taking with you today. Uh, and uh, you will see for yourself that uh, the surface is a very exciting uh, and varied uh, surface. Uh, we were looking for the oldest surface uh, in the uh, solar system so that we record, could record those uh, early events in the solar system. Uh, we were also looking for the building blocks that uh, we thought 
were used to build the terrestrial planets like the Earth uh, and uh, try to understand uh, the workings of those small objects. Uh, and I'm, I, we will uh, show you a little bit of the evidence today that we've uh, captured that and uh, that it will be very, very informative to our understanding of the Earth as well as our understanding of the asteroid belt. Can I have the first image, please? Uh, this uh, image will show the uh, 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 still image of Vesta. I still don't see uh, the first image uh, yet. It, oh, okay, it's not on uh, my monitor. Um, Okay, um, and uh, you can see, although I cannot see, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, rotation axis north uh, end of it is in the upper left-hand uh, corner, and in the lower right of the image <coughs> is the southern uh, region. Uh, what <coughs> happened many years ago and was revealed by the Hubble Space Telescope is that there was a very large uh, impact uh, on Vesta and it has, uh, let's say, damaged the uh, southern uh, part of the uh, <coughs> of Vesta and uh, then spread material and uh, around the solar system and uh, uh, around the surface uh, so that we're seeing quite a different uh, terrain on the south uh, than the north. Um, the uh, images across the surface can be then turned into a mosaic and as sort of a photographic map of the surface. Uh, and I would like to uh, queue up uh, that and if the audience could tell me when it's there, uh, then, okay, uh, then, well, oh, and it's on the monitors now, good. Uh, what we are seeing here uh, is the equatorial regions, about plus or minus 30 degrees of latitude on the surface, and we can see the south uh, is much smoother than the north here. We see lots of craters. That's partially illumination, but also uh, partially that uh, there is an older surface with with much more craters on the uh, in the north. Uh, these craters are very interesting. They have uh, features in it th in them that we did not expect, uh, and we're uh, learning about uh, these processes that create these features now. Um, <clears throat> today, uh, as we go through the uh, press conference, we will be looking at more pictures from the uh, framing camera. The framing camera not only gives us the black and white images that you just saw, but also uh, color images. Uh, and we can use pairs of images for making uh, stereo uh, pictures. And that will give us the dimensions of the body, the topography, and we can have a digital model uh, of the uh, asteroid. Uh, we will also take a look at uh, images returned from the uh, visible and infrared mapping spectrometer. Uh, that instrument gives very fine uh, resolution on color. It gives us the full spectrum uh, from visible to through the near infrared. Uh, and that can give us uh, mineral identification so we know exactly uh, what the surface is made out of and also uh, the surface temperature. Now, as the uh, mission progress, progresses, we will be taking data at higher and higher resolution that will enable us to understand the surface processes and interior processes uh, better. Uh, we, when we get down to about 200 kilometers <coughs> altitude above the surface, then we'll be able to measure the elemental composition, the uh, metals like aluminum and magnesium on the surface, uh, and determine uh, more about the way that the body uh, came together. Uh, in, that in that altitude range, we'll also be taking gravity data and radio from the radio telemetry system and learn more about the mass distribution. <clears throat> Today, we will uh, examine the initial images from the framing camera and from the visible and infrared mapping spectrometer. Uh, these photos have been already a great revolution, uh, revelation to the team about what the surface is like 
We did not imagine the detail that we're seeing and the various processes that uh, we're seeing evidence of now. Uh, these are uh, really insightful into the, this building block uh, of the early solar system. Um, <clears throat> well, I thought that you know we would have uh, you know look at uh, an early planet uh, or protoplanet out there in the uh, system, but it's really uh, a beautiful. Uh, an exciting small world sitting there in the middle of the asteroid belt that we're going to learn very much about. Um, but before we get into some of those images, uh, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Mark Raymond, uh, Don's chief engineer and mission director, to tell us more about iron propulsion and how we got to uh, Vesta and what we'll be doing there. Mark? Thank you, Chris. Well, I share Chris's excitement, and I know the entire Dawn team does. I mean, one of the things that's so neat about this mission is that we're exploring some of the last uncharted worlds in the inner solar system. And the way we got into orbit is very different from what you're accustomed to, in which a spacecraft comes screaming up to its destination at high velocity and then executes a whiplash-inducing burn while our friends and colleagues sit here in mission control biting their nails and tensely waiting for the good news. And the reason it's so different on Dawn is because, as you heard, we take advantage of the tremendous capability of ion propulsion, which I first heard of in a Star Trek episode. And while the ion propulsion is extremely efficient, the ion thruster only pushes on the spacecraft as hard as this single piece of paper pushes on my hand. And yet gradually, over time, the effect of this whisper-like thrust can build up and produce fantastically high velocity. So this is what I like to call acceleration with patience. And now our patience is paying off very handsomely indeed. So most spacecraft spend most of their time coasting, just like Earth and the Moon coast in their orbits. But Dawn has spent 70% of its time in space gently thrusting, gradually reshaping its orbit around the sun to match Vesta's orbit around the sun. And the effect of all that maneuvering is that Vesta and Dawn together were racing around the sun in very similar paths. And this is no different from when you drive your car on a freeway ne near another car. You may both be traveling at high speed, but your relative velocity can be very low. And so when Dawn entered orbit, it was only approaching Vesta at 60 miles an hour. The last time it approached a destination at that speed is when it was being driven on a truck to Cape Canaveral. Now, thanks to all the thrusting that we've been doing all along the way, Dawn was able to slowly creep up on Vesta and slip ever so gently into orbit with the same grace and elegance it's displayed in nearly a thousand days of interplanetary ion thrusting. From the spacecraft's point of view, this was a very typical day in the mission. But it so happened that at about 9.47 p.m. on July 15th, it was traveling close enough and slowly enough that Vesta's gravity tenderly took hold of the spacecraft and Dawn was in orbit even as it was continuing to thrust. Now, we had no need to monitor it. Our mission control was empty. I was out dancing. And yet, it all worked perfectly. And about 25 hours later, we conducted a routine communication session and verified that the spacecraft is healthy and that it went into orbit exactly as we had planned. So it's exciting, it's important, it's really neat, but it wasn't tense and it wasn't dramatic. Now because the thrust is so gentle, the spacecraft changes course only gradually. And so it's been spiraling around Vesta slowly getting closer and closer. Now we stopped thrusting for a few days to collect the spectacular images that you're seeing today, but we've since resumed and the spacecraft is now descending to its first science orbit. And at an altitude of 1,700 miles, we'll begin our intensive observations of Vesta at, uh, on August 11th. And so if we take a look at the first video, we can see an animation of Dawn in orbit around Vesta and see the way it operates. And I don't see it projected here, but if you're seeing it, okay, so there it is. You can see the fields of view of the camera and the mapping spectrometer. When we're on the day side, we collect these images. 
And when we're on the night side, we return the data. And I like this view because to me, this sort of suggests how big Vesta is. You know, I think most people think of asteroids as these little chips of rock, maybe the size of a building or a mountain or even a city. But Vesta is entirely unlike that. At 330 miles in diameter, it has twice the surface area of California. I mean, this is a big place. In fact, Vesta is the second most massive resident of the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Now, thanks to the maneuvering power of the ion propulsion system, we can change our orbits a great deal. And so when we're finished conduct conducting our observations in this first science orbit, we'll spiral to our next one. And we'll have a different view of Vesta. And we'll continue this pattern over the next year, each time going to an orbit which is optimized for a particular set of scientific investigations. And then in July of next year, we'll use the ion propulsion system to spiral out of orbit. And so if we take a look at the next animation, we can see Dawn using its ion propulsion system, leaving what by then will be a well-explored world and heading for dwarf planet Ceres, which we'll reach in 2015, and once again, we'll spiral into orbit to conduct a campaign there of revealing what secrets this world holds about the dawn of the solar system. And Dawn actually isn't only the first spacecraft to orbit an object in the main asteroid belt, but this is the first spacecraft targeted to orbit any two solar system destinations. And this is a true interplanetary spaceship. Just orbiting Vesta alone, which we've now accomplished, would have been unaffordable within the constraints of the Discovery Program if we used conventional propulsion. And orbiting Vesta and Ceres together would be truly impossible. But what I think is really exciting about this is that after two centuries of observing this fuzzy little blob of light among the stars, Earth now has a robotic emissary in orbit at Vesta. And so to continue to tell you about this amazing place, because I mean, we're here today to say, Earth, meet Vesta. And to continue that introduction, I'd like to turn it over to Holger Zierks from the Framing Camera team. Thank you, Mark. As the person uh, responsible for the Framing Camera distribution, uh, contribution to Dawn, I'm really exciting, excited today to share these images with you. I want to show Vesta is be at best resolution to date, a movie of Vesta rotating and zoom-ins at distinct uh, areas. So uh, can I get the first image, please? This is a full-frame uh, image of Vesta, as the one uh, Chris has shown uh, with the mosaic. The North Pole is on the upper left, the South Pole on the lower right. The image was taken on July 24 at a distance of 5,200 kilometers and a resolution of approximately 500 meters. You see the shape of Vesta with the central peak at the South Pole, the lower right. The South Pole area appears to be uh, smoother, certainly different, and less cratered uh, than the Northern Hemisphere. Vesta is rich in albedo contrast. You see the uh, bright spots and the dark areas on the, on the surface of Vesta. There are topographic highs and lows and elongated wide and kilometers deep grooves in the north. There are also deep grooves in the equatorial region. Uh, these can be better seen in the Vesta movie. So uh, let's now get Vesta rotate. We see a full rotation of Vesta over 5.3 hours, you see the elongated grooves at the equatorial region coming out nicely. The orbital motion of the spacecraft during the uh, imaging brought us from the uh, equatorial to the mid-southern latitudes. So that's why you see the North Pole, uh, the South Pole peak coming out nicely in our view. The southern hemisphere appears very different compared to the north. Vesta is so rich in features that it will keep the science team busy for years. Let's now zoom into some surface features of Vesta with the next image. The South Pole peak at the lower right 
um, shows various structures. Note the uh, scale bar is 15 uh, kilometers, so the structures are large. The equatorial region on the left side shows deep grooves and a very contrast-rich perspective. This region also appears to be heavily cratered. The visible dark and bright features are discussed within the Dawn science team, and we need images from lower altitude orbit really to understand these. Uh, the South Pole region, again, appears much less cratered in contrast to the North. Uh, we want to look at uh, two crater close-up areas on the next image. So uh, this set of three craters, we nicknamed uh, these uh, the snowmen. So you see the, uh, the two large and the, uh, the small on top. They are located in the northern hemisphere. The craters appear to be filled with debris, and they have an ejector blanket around. So the rims, they appear mostly sharp, but we also see downhill landslides in various areas. Uh, let's look at craters with uh, uh, dark and uh, bright slopes. All of these large craters in this image are located on the southern equatorial region. They show distinct bright and dark features and uh, and uh, we are investigating these, uh, the differences between the dark and the bright areas uh, within the Dawn Science team. The uh, crater rims appear sharp uh, around, the, and we see an ejector blanket again around the craters. We don't know yet what the dark spots mean to us, what they tell to us, but we will find out when we get the higher resol resolution images from the lower orbit. The framing camera also has colors, as we has, have heard before. Let's have a look what they can tell us. This image is a false color composite, so not a true color as you would see it with bare eyes. It's a composite of a crater just south of the equator. The color composite is used to show us differences in composition of the material on the surface and is indicative for the chemistry and mineralogy on Vesta. We see that Vesta is covered with different material. So uh, you see this uh, red stuff in the south area of the crater. We see that uh, the, uh, it's, there's different material on the surface, and we will learn uh, what these differences mean to us. We will find out. So Vesta is not only one uniform <coughs> unit everywhere. The uh, spectral diversity of uh, Vesta is the domain of the VIR instrument team. And with this, I hand over to Dr. Enrico Flamini and the VIR team. Thank you very much. Yes, indeed. I mean, uh, the visible imaging must be spectrometer as, as a primary goal to understand the mineralogical and distribution and composition of the surface. Is, a, is an imaging spectrometer that has been uh, uh, provided by the Italian Space Agency and is capable to delivering detailed images and um, detailed spectra up to 864 different spectra and uh, up to a resolution of uh, 50 meters uh, at the, when we are going to arrive to 200 kilometers uh, orbit, as well as uh, <coughs> uh, the capability to have an extended uh, spectral range between ultraviolet, uh, I mean, 0.25 microns up to the infrared, but to five microns. May we have see the first image, please? Here you can see uh, an image that is essentially a photograph acquired selecting three different spectral bands that are blue, red, and, and green that can be compared and, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to, to the images, beautiful and spectacular images acquired by the camera. Even if, of course, the spatial resolution is different because the instrument has a different scope. But what we can see here, that is an image acquired by 5,200 kilometers, is a, a portion of the surface between 7 degrees and 40 degrees of a northern hemisphere of Vista, uh, Vesta. And the larger crater that you can see there is uh, 50 kilometers in diameter. Then in the next image is a more uh, peculiar 
image uh, uh, elaborated, uh, taking into account uh, the uh, different in, 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 uh, in colors, and then uh, the, uh, to emphasize the diversity of the composition of the vesta surface. You can see here that there are bright differences, I mean, a very dramatic difference in different regions. And these are indicating, then, then we will see more in the future and during the, the detailed analysis of the surface, uh, that there is not only a difference in uh, mineralogical composition, but also in the, in the size distribution and the, and the, and the uh, behavior thermal behavior of the recolyte that here and there is covering the surface of Vesta. In the next image that is taken in, uh, in the infrared part of the spectra, so between 3.5 and 5 microns, is uh, essentially the thermal emission of, the, of, of Vesta. Vesta is, Vesta is a, a warm body, quote unquote warm. Let's say that today we can estimate it between 20, 250 and 270 degree Kelvin. And from this image, you can see that there are cold areas that are uh, the inside of a large crater and some bright hot spots here and there. Even this is uh, something that is, of course, analyzed uh, in more detail, but is going to give us also the behavior of the surface with respect to the illumination from the sun. Finally, let me just say a few words about the fact that I'm extremely proud and happy as Italian Space Agency and also representing the Italian National uh, Institute for Astrophysics to be and share with you the emotion of these images that are providing us a new view on the beginning of our solar system. And also to be here as a friend of Angelita Corradini who proposed us, actually proposed to me, this instrument 10 years ago when I was uh, director for science uh, exploration uh, in uh, solar system exploration in the agency and uh, today we are seeing and looking at how this instrument is behaving and provide important information that will be merged with all the other information of the instruments providing us the understanding of the body. Thanks. All right. All right, with that, we will open this up for questions. We can begin here in JPL, or we can go to our calls online. We have several callers on the phone right now. Any questions here in the auditorium at this point? Oh, just a second, we'll get a mic over to you, and please state your name and affiliation. Yes, thank you. John Brooks, KNX News Radio. Mr. Raymond. This goes back to the beginning of the solar system. Can you give us a time frame and, and when do you think that this asteroid was formed and what its possible composition is? Actually, I think that question would be more appropriate for the principal investigator. Yeah. Uh, we believe this goes to the, back to the first five million years of the solar system. So that's, uh, the geochemists tell us that that is 4.65 uh, billion years ago. Uh, so 400 and uh, you know, 4,650 million uh, years ago. Uh, and uh, uh, what happened back then uh, was that uh, the material that was uh, orbiting what was going to become the sun uh, began, began to condense. Uh, and uh, we have evidence of what was going on through very primitive meteorites that have fallen to the Earth. Uh, but right uh, when uh, Vesta uh, started to uh, come together. We believe there was a supernova that irradiated uh, the material and added radioactive material to it that when the material came together, it had an additional heat source and some of these bodies that were formed melted and then differentiated. They made, uh, you know, a crust of lava, an iron core. Uh, and that is the, uh, those are some of the oldest uh, bodies out there, but they occurred at a particular time, and that makes Vesta very special because it's our, uh, our only good example of that particular period of the solar system formation. And we're very, very happy, really happy uh, to be able to uh, look down at the surface and see what was going on uh, at those very early moments of the solar system. All right, do we have another question here in the room? 
um, right here in front of me. Hi, I'm Emily Lochtawala from the Planetary Society. And um, first of all, congratulations. These images are so exciting. Um, my second, my question is, um, I know it's early, but have you compared the shape of Vesta to what was predicted from Hubble? Um, it, it seems to me that it's a little taller than, than uh, it appeared in the Hubble models. Um, now, what the people who made those uh, maps uh, and models from the Hubble data, when they saw our initial images, they said, oh, we got it wrong. Uh, and but they didn't get it wrong. It just looks that way when you got the higher resolution. So I think they did a superb job at modeling the Hubble data, and uh, we're maybe find some differences. Of course, we got higher resolution, but I think that uh, everything is perfectly consistent uh, with the Hubble data. And and then I think there is a there is a dark area on Vesta that was predicted from. Um, Astronomic, uh, astronomical observations. Do, are yeah. you finding that yeah, with your we're high seeing, resolution? Yeah, we're seeing quite a varied surface. And we, again, with a higher resolution, uh, it's not, uh, you don't always see exactly what that low resolution image was before uh, and figured it out. We'll figure that out eventually. But uh, we certainly see a, a quite varied surface, varied albedo. You saw bright areas, dark areas. We saw, we see dark material we never expected. Uh, on there, you know, the, what what is causing those craters with the, you know, the black streaks going down them? I haven't seen anything like that before. Thank you. All right, we're going to move over to some of the questions on the phone. First person is Lee Holtz with the Wall Street Journal. Lee? Yes, thank you. Uh, this is uh, very, very exciting and interesting uh, stuff. I, I wonder if you all could uh, help my readers understand a little bit more about the very distinctive uh, grooves um, that band uh, Vesta that you were just showing us on those images, very dramatic structures. What what might have caused them? What are they? Tell us a little bit more about their characteristics, please. Holder, do you want to take this or would you rather I take it? Uh, I think you better take okay. it. Okay. Um, that um, if you take a look at, at those images and you saw Vesta rotating in them, you, it'd be very apparent that those grooves are pretty much in the equatorial region, uh, and uh, they're very much perpendicular to the direction we thought, think that the impact was going uh, when it hit, struck Vesta down what, where it now is the uh, southern uh, polar region. So uh, w one thing that it could be is that when the uh, compression of that fantastic impact came that Vesta got uh, smaller uh, in that direction for a while and then uh, expanded and that caused tectonic features around the equatorial region. That's only speculation at the present time. We need those higher resolution images to understand uh, the morphology of the surface in those grooves. But uh, the orientation of the grooves uh, suggests that it was uh, associated with that early uh, giant impact. All right, we have another caller on the phone, Dan Vergano, USA Today. Dan. Thanks very much. Dan Vergano with USA Today. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk at this point about how optimistic you are of using that southern crater as an assay to look deeper into Vesta, and perhaps more widely uh, using crater counts or that sort of thing to, to date or age the, the asteroid. Is, is it still work the same way out in the asteroid belt as it does for the interterrestrial planets? Um, let me... Uh, 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 speak to the last set of uh, points first, um, that uh, yes, we're using exactly the same uh, crater counting techniques uh, as we uh, do on the lunar surface or on other uh, planetary surfaces, uh, and uh, we're getting something of the order of uh, four uh, billion years in age. Uh, we need the, again, the, I, I sound like it may be a broken record, but we need those higher resolution data uh, in order to do a better job at the uh, crater counting. Uh, and when we do, we'll be able to, uh, we hope, uh, differentiate the age in one part of the surface uh, with another. Uh, now, you asked about the uh, southern crater. Could you repeat the first part of your question so I uh, answer it properly?
Did we? We must have lost them. Let's go to the next question then. This one is from Denise Chow of Space.com. Hi, uh, Denise Chow with Space.com. Thanks for taking my question. Um, question for Chris Russell. I was just wondering if you could share um, the most surprising thing that you've found so far about the surface of Vesta from these images. Uh, that's like saying, who's your favorite child? Uh, the, um, uh, that, uh, you know, those grooves are really neat. And, you know, we saw those really early. Uh, and uh, they uh, puzzled us and uh, pleased us at the same time uh, because it's something we didn't expect and it's going to tell us more about what was going on in the early days. Uh, taking a look at the color intensity of the surface, uh, I was really pleased by that because, uh, you know, sometimes when you uh, go to, uh, you know, a smaller asteroid, it's pretty uniform. It's just a block of material. This is not a uniform body. Different things were happening in different regions of the uh, surface, uh, and that indicates to me that the interior was being very active. It was making this min mineral over here and making that over there and pumping it out onto the surface. Uh, so things were going on, and we're going to learn about how bodies uh, such as uh, you know, Vesta uh, worked when they were uh, uh, being, uh, you know, coming together and evolving. So we're learning, going to learn much about the evolution. But, you know, you saw those craters uh, with the uh, black and white uh, debris streaming down uh, in them. What, why such a great color contrast or albedo contrast on, on that material? It's not something uh, I'm familiar with. We're going to have to take a very careful look at that. And when we see surprises, uh, that things that don't fit into our understanding, our preconceived understanding, then we're going to learn. And we're going to learn a lot from this body. All right, we have another caller, Leo Enright from Irish TV. Yes, th thanks for taking my question. A couple of small questions, really. First, uh, the snowman, could you clarify that that is the large feature that we see uh, on the equator and maybe talk a little bit about that? But also uh, for Dr. Flamini uh, to ask, uh, what was the reaction? These multispectral pictures uh, that uh, Dr. Russell has been describing were very, very dramatic. Did, did it cause a gasp in the science room when it was first seen? Uh well, certainly it did. Uh, when we first saw those uh, pictures, uh, that uh, we really uh, did gasp and, and, and smile a lot. Uh, but I would like to uh, pass the mic over to Holger, and uh, he can tell us uh, a little bit more about the snowman, and then Dr. Flamini can uh, tell us uh, about the Veer pictures. So Holger first. Yeah, well, I can confirm the, uh, the two craters you refer to, the large craters in the equatorial region. This is the, uh, what we nicknamed uh, the, uh, the snowman. So it's not only these two craters, it's only the small one on top of it, of it so that's the head of the snowman. And uh, these two craters, the bigger ones, they are very interesting to us because they appear to be shallow and uh, filled with debris. So these are huge features on the surface, and they also have a land landslide area, so we can, uh, we can uh, discuss and uh, investigate on the uh, mat material that was sliding down the rims of the crater. So uh, if that uh, would uh, answer your question, I hand over to Enrico. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, when uh, uh, the images that you have seen at first, let me say that these are the first uh, data that uh, are, have been acquired, and so far, so far it means that a lot of analysis to be done, and still, and uh, there is a lot of work, years of work to do it. But uh, what we can see from now, and what we can say from now, is that uh, in these images that correspond to uh, different spectral data, it means to different kind of mineralogy composition, mineralogical composition, and even to the size of the regolith particles as well of the aging of the surface. We can derive information uh, on which are the minerals and then how they are associated to the craters and then to the formation, then to the age of the body. And uh, uh, what we can see today already is that uh, this body is not uniform at all. It's not a, a rock. 
that the muscle more, more or less has the same homogeneity in composition, but is a differentiated body that has undergone, underwent, I mean, as a, a, in history of evolution, and uh, also as a, some kind of differentiation during the evolution. So it's a, it, it's a complex body. It's, a, it's, a, it's something that is real in the middle between uh, an asteroid as we have seen uh, since so, so far and, and the planet. And uh, what the images can tell us today is that this is quite likely true. All right, we have a follow-up call from USA Today. Dan, are you back? Yeah. Uh, what I was just wondering was how optimistic are you about using that very large southern crater now as a way to look deeper into the planet, to look at this differentiation, that sort of thing? Um, okay. The, um, uh, well, the, the cra the, that impact has happened, and it seems to have removed a lot of material, carved the southern part of the what I call planet, too many times. I mean, the IAU would get all over me. But I uh, think that uh, of this body is really the smallest terrestrial planet. Well, it's carved uh, some material off, and fortunately it did, because then that material's been falling on Earth uh, over all these years, so we got a, a good idea. We have samples returned from Vesta already. Um, but that, uh, and that material is, is pretty much, you know, uh, you know, uh, two different types, uh, uh, the eucrites and the uh, diogenites, uh, with a mixture of, the, in, of them in what we call the howardite. Uh, but um, we have now uh, gone, gone deeper into the planet because of uh, that event. And we have craters now in that material that are excavating down even further. So we will be looking in the craters in the crater uh, next uh, to get deeper down into the planet. And I think that's that uh, expectation that uh, uh, we uh, were planning on, I think that will come to fore by uh, looking at the, the uh, later craters in the big crater. And we have another follow-up from Lee Holtz, Wall Street Journal. Uh, yes, please. I wonder if I could ask you all to just look forward uh, for us uh, over the next couple of months. You said that as um, the spacecraft spirals into progressively closer orbits around Vesta, each one of those orbits would lend itself to a particular uh, kind of scientific observation. So I'm wondering if you can just give us a sense of that process, please. Okay. Uh, let me let me uh, take that. Um, the uh, next thing that we're going to do we call survey orbit, but it's really optimized for the VIR or the visible and infrared spectrometer, and we will get the chemical uh, composition of the entire surface, uh, uh, the minerals uh, that are on the surface totally mapped in the sunlit areas, uh, which will be about 80% of the uh, body. We'll also, of course, take uh, camera images too, but uh, the uh, part of the orbit that's optimized for the camera uh, is what we call the low altitude mapping orbit, which will uh, start uh, in, if I remember the date right, in late September and go through uh, the next month uh, approximately. Uh, and then we will have all the images that we need to uh, do stereo work, uh, to uh, get the uh, size and shape of the body uh, very accurately. Uh, and then when we finish that uh, mapping in the uh, high altitude mapping orbit, we go into the uh, imaginatively named low altitude mapping orbit, uh, where uh, we uh, are about only 200 uh, kilometers above the surface, and uh, our gamma ray and neutron uh, detector uh, will measure, uh, you know, is sensitive enough to, uh, and has enough resolution for us to uh, start making maps of the elements uh, that uh, go into uh, these minerals, and that will give us uh, uh, more ideas and more insight into how uh, the body uh, evolved and uh, came into its uh, current uh, state. Uh, at the same time, we'll be able to take high-resolution gravity measurements uh, with the radio system and learn more about the mass distribution in the body. Does that answer your question? 
All right, we have one more question in uh, the queue for the phone interviews, okay. uh, and it's Ken Kramer with Space Flight Magazine, and then we'll bring it back into the room. Ken? Hi, thanks for taking my questions. Uh, first, again, congratulations for the team. I haven't seen the launch. It's pretty fantastic to see your results right now. Uh, the, res the question I have is um, I'd like to know about this South Pole region. If there is anything this magnitude anywhere else in the, in the solar system that has this um, gigantic central peak at it. And um, now that you've seen it, are you reevaluating um, your opinions on its formation compared to the data you had uh, from the Hubble Space Telescope? And uh, secondly, um, is there any other close analog in the solar system to Vesta, or is this uh, completely unique? Thanks. Are you sure you're not a member of the science team? Uh, that was an excellent question, and that is exactly the question that the team has been uh, mulling over for the last couple of weeks. Uh, and uh, my uh, email uh, box is filled with ideas of, uh, uh, and analogs and, you know, the closest is, uh, is this, but this is made of ice. The, you, know, uh, you know, this, this has uh, cra uh, crater walls all the way around it, you know, but the one we have at, uh, you know, at Vesta doesn't, you know, have you ever seen anything like it? And um, we, we basically, this, this is unique in many, many features. Uh, it uh, is almost a body shattering event. Uh, it was really very large uh, by looking, you know, the grooves that we talked about earlier. Uh, that's evidence that, uh, uh, that uh, there was really uh, a, a strong force when this body slammed into uh, Vesta. Uh, I'm really anxious to look at the North Pole to see if how that uh, energy uh, focused uh, through the body and what it did to the uh, north, uh, but we w unfortunately that's in darkness now. This is hiding from us. Um, and, but we do not have a good analog anywhere else. We have uh, this uh, feature it's uh, what we expected in the sense that, yes, uh, it seems to be an impact feature. Yes, it's got a, a central peak in it. Uh, yes, there are some crater rim uh, uh, places uh, there, so uh, we're fairly sure it's a crater. Uh, we're going to be looking for melt on, uh, you know, on the surface there, ponding of uh, melt. Uh, we'll look for exactly how uh, these grooves that are in this area uh, are uh, shaped. It may be that uh, that the, uh, the the fact that Vesta was rotating very quickly uh, and this was a very large event uh, twisted the material uh, and made uh, twisted grooves in in the surface. We'll be uh, looking uh, for that. So there's a lot of uh, <coughs> things that we'll be doing to study this, but. Uh, we haven't found the perfect analog yet. We've found analogs for this particular uh, property or that particular property, but altogether, this is something uh, that is very new to us and we'll be studying it uh, very intently. All right, we're going to bring it back to the room and we have time just for two more questions, Emily and Alicia Chang. I'm just, uh, I was struck by how fresh looking a lot of the craters are. I was wondering if I should have been surprised by that or um, if it's what you expect in the asteroid belt. Well, you're, you're always going to have some fresh craters uh, because this stuff is falling all the time. Uh, what we need to do is to try and understand uh, the uh, weathering process, the aging process, uh, and we haven't had an, a chance to do that. That'll take the higher resolution data. But yes, you're seeing the same thing that the science team is seeing. Uh, they're all constantly uh, commenting on the freshness of some of the craters. All right, and a question from AP, Alicia Chang. Alicia Chang with the Associated Press. Um, as you officially start your science campaign next week, are there already plans to release raw images as they come in, as with other missions, or will they all be processed and? Uh, yes, um, our plan is to have an image of the day uh, and to have uh, the scientists select out one of the you know thousands of images that come down uh, so that you get a uh, continuous update on what we're finding and uh, that you get uh, representative uh, samples of the whole uh, planet. So we're going to uh, 
go into our archive rather than inundate you with them all have a, uh, a best picture for you uh, to make it, uh, to keep it interesting. All right, so that wraps up our Q&A, and we will replay all of our images following this news conference. And the news conference will be played back in its entirety on NASA TV, as well as NASA's Ustream channel and JPL's Ustream channel. And for more information, you should check out the website at www.nasa.gov. I'd like to thank our panelists, and thank you, the viewer, for joining us.